are in week number two of our summer session series. And last week we learned that to the world, the gospel is foolish and the gospel is upside down. But to the church, we know the gospel is wise and it's right side up. And most importantly, it's all about Jesus. And so we're gonna continue with that, that, um, that motif, with that truth, and we're gonna look at 1 Corinthians chapter two. So I want you to go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter two. And um, while you're turning there, I wanna ask you a question. It's about gifts. And I really believe like there are two, maybe three camps of people when it comes to giving and receiving gifts. So I'm gonna need your participation in this. So no matter where you are, I want you to raise your hand when I call out your group. If you're driving and watching, just, I don't know, like, just do it later, okay? You don't need to raise your hand because we don't want you in a car wreck telling us which group you're in, okay? That's not very, very safe. So you just do it later. Everybody else that can physically participate, let's do it. The first group is, if you love to buy gifts like a year and a half advance, and put them somewhere in your house that resembles Fort Knox and you have a biometric code that has to be able to get to the gifts. If that's you, just go ahead and raise your hand for me. That's the first group. Come on, you know you are. You're OCD, it's okay, we know it. Actually, you're CDO, that's OCD in alphabetical order. That's okay. All right, that's the first group. Second group, you are the people who like to, um, for the biometric scan code that your spouse has implemented for the gift uh, hiding, you actually like to go get a piece of tape and steal their fingertip uh, print in the middle of the night and go find the gift. This is the second group. You are the ones who like to go find the gifts because you're all a bunch of thieves and you want to get the gift as soon as you can and you're so good at it, you can open it, play with it, put it back in the box like the manufacturer did and make it look like it was never open. If you're the second group of people and you like to go find groups, raise your hand. I see your spouse nudging you, yes, raise your hand. Okay, y'all are a bunch of liars right now, okay? Um, there, there actually is a third group, there's a third group. This is the group that my wife falls into, all right? It's a really good group, they have really big hearts, they have really good hearts, they do. You're great at buying gifts and you buy them early and you come under budget and it's the perfect gift, and you buy it you know, six months out. But you just can't wait to see the person's reaction, and so you have to give it to them three months before their, before their birthday. If that's you, would you please raise your hand? Wow, okay, a lot more people than I expected. Like my wife Tiffany, she is in that camp. Um, Father's Day and my birthday are like a week apart, and so just for future re reference next year, okay? Thank you, that's a little, little shameless plug there from Earth. I'm a size large, okay, in shirts, and I'm a size, uh, Pastor Jim does this all the time, so I feel like I'm allowed to do it, okay? So, <laughs> totally kidding. But for my, my birthday and Father's Day, we kind of like this big group celebration thing, we combine all, and she goes, um, hey, I bought all of your presents for Father's Day and for your birthday. I know they're not for a few weeks, but uh, they're all right here. Would you like to open them now or wait till your Father's Day and birthday? Okay, great, here you go, thank you. <laughs> I didn't get to respond. I had, like, and then she just stood there. <laughs> like, if you don't open this right now, and if you're not excited about every gift, you're gonna crush my spirit. It's okay, I love you though. And so I had to open them right then. Like, I had to open them because she can't stand the mystery. She wants, to, she's a really good gift giver. Like, she knows what you like. She knows your favorite store. She will go get your favorite coffee from your favorite coffee shop a year before you're supposed to get it. It will be fresh the day she gives it to you a year later. I'm not kidding. Like, she's that good at giving gifts, and she loves to watch the response. She's great at gift giving, but not so great at the mystery. You know, God is really, really, really good at giving gifts. And he actually prefers that they're hidden in mystery. Do you know why? It's not because he's manipulative. It's not because he's a bad father. It's actually because he's a really good father. I think, this is just John Michael's take. This is my conjecture on why God hides gifts. I think God hides gifts in mystery because he loves the pursuit. Not the pursuit of the gift itself, but the pursuit of the gift giver. Because when you're waiting on a gift from God, what do you have to do? You gotta talk to him about it. So I think God hides gifts and shrouds them in mystery so that we find him, okay? The title of my, mis uh, of my message today is God's Mystery Revealed. 
God's mystery revealed. And we're going to take a look at what the Apostle Paul has to say about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So we're going to go ahead and read right there starting verse, with verses 1 through 5. And here's what he says. He's writing to the Corinthian church. Remember, it's that really important port city of Corinth on the Isthmus of Greece. And they're going through a lot of crazy stuff right now. And Paul's writing this letter. It's actually a second letter to correct them and to bring order. Here's what he says. When I came to you, talking about the first time, brothers and sisters, I did not come as someone superior in speaking ability or wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I'm going to stop for just a moment. Um, I'm going to get on a soapbox for like half a second if you'll let me. Even if you won't let me, I got the mic. I'm going to do it anyway. So there are a lot of people who say that they're, when they're talking about like their favorite preacher, they'll go, yeah, he or she, they're a great communicator. Communicating is different than preaching. Everyone communicates, not everyone preaches. And that doesn't mean that preaching is better. But when you preach, it's not just about communicating with your hands or your illustrations or really cool lights or screens or great stories. All of the things are wonderful and they are not wrong. But preaching must carry the weight and the burden of the gospel and it must be accompanied by the power of the Holy Spirit. I can listen to a great TED Talk, but it's not gonna change my life. I don't care if you're a good communicator. Are you preaching the gospel? And Paul said, I don't preach anything except Christ and him crucified. And it goes on to say in verse three, I also was with you in weakness and fear and in great trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but listen to this, in demonstration of the spirit and of power. The Holy Spirit in power. So that why? Your faith would not rest on the wisdom of mankind, but on the, everybody say it with me, power of God. Paul said, I want your faith. What is your faith? It's your belief in who God says he is and what he says he'll do. He said, I want your faith to rest on nothing else but on his power. That's it. And I love that Paul accompanies the power with the person of the Holy Spirit and with the crucifixion of Jesus. It's very important. Um, he says that I didn't come to you with man's words of wisdom. I didn't come to you come to you with persuasive words. It means he wasn't a good salesman. He wasn't trying to be salesman. He wasn't a, a, a snake oil salesman. He wasn't going, well, if you buy now, then you'll get two of these things for $19.99. But wait, there's more. That's not what he's doing. Like, he's not doing that. Paul's a terrible salesman. In fact, he said, I, was, I came to you with fear and trembling. Like, Paul was shaking when he preached the gospel. That sounds like a really poor communicator to me. But it's important because in the first century, the Corinthian church would have been so used to hearing um, multiple different philosophies being studied and multiple different philosophies de being debated um, on street corners and in amphitheaters. And they would have heard, well, this guy came up with this new philosophy. And, well, they contradict what Socrates said, though. And that contradicts what um, Aristotle said. And they would just constantly hear these new ideas being taught. And they also had to deal with um, heretical teachings, one of them being Gnosticism. The word Gnostic um, means secret knowledge, and it's actually still around today. In fact, it's, it's um, unfortunately infiltrated its way into some churches. And the Gnostics believed a whole lot of really wrong things. They believed that everything physical was evil and um, and only what couldn't be seen was the only good and holy things. If that's the case, then why, God, why did God call his physical creation good? Doesn't make any sense. And they also believed that they had a secret knowledge apart from what Jesus taught, which is what the apostles were teaching. So Paul, the apostles, the early church fathers into the first, second, third century, they were really having to battle Gnosticism, that there was this mysterious secret knowledge out there. You know, like the law of attraction. If you, just, if you just think it long enough, if you just believe it hard enough, then you'll get that thing. You'll get that marriage. You'll get that whatever it is you're looking for. In fact, there's a book about it uh, called The Secret in 2006. It's just repackaged Gnosticism. That's what it is. And Paul was going, that is not what we believe. We believe in the power of God through 
his son, Jesus. And Paul was reminding the Corinthian church, everything we believe is wrapped up in the crucifixion of Christ, which like we learned last week was um, offensive to the Jews because their Messiah, their conquering king was going to, in their minds, rem remove their oppressors and set up a physical kingdom, which Jesus will do one day, but he wasn't doing it the first time he came. So they were offended because Christ was crucified. Then the, Gr the Greeks thought it was stupid that Jesus was crucified because that was the most embarrassing form of humiliating death that the Romans had ever come up with. So it would be stupid for a God, number one, to stoop down to human level, and then number two, be crucified in a humili humiliating way. It's illogical. And Greeks were all about logic. And Paul says, wisdom's okay. There are some things you can learn from the world. Absolutely, there are people who are smart. God's given them a gift. Even if they don't follow Jesus, no problem. But you know what? We don't rest in that. We rest in the power of our crucified king because we know that through his death, we are alive and we have resurrection power in us because we know he didn't stay on the cross. He got off the cross and he's alive and well. And I'm only going to preach that to you. I don't care if it's persuasive or not. The gospel doesn't need my help. I'm just gonna tell you who Jesus is and God's gonna reveal his mystery to you through the power of the cross cross. It's amazing to me because when you, when you go back to the beginning, and I really mean the beginning, when you look at Genesis 1, God actually starts to reveal his plan for us of salvation to save the whole world. Because you know what? That's actually what the mystery of God is. The mystery of God is that he wants to save us. He wants to rescue us. That's it, plain and simple. That's the gospel story. But we got to understand how we got to the crucified Christ. When you go to Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth. And on day six, he made mankind. We're the only creature he made in his image. That's what makes us different from animals, okay? We're not animals. We're made in the image of God. God is not an animal, okay? And so that was what separates us. He fashioned us out of, out of dust, breathed his own air into our lungs. Incredible. Then in chapter two, he shows mankind all of the beautiful creation that they get to oversee and have dominion over, all the animals they get to name, and can you imagine trying to name the rhinoceros? Like, how fun would that be? Like, how crazy is that? Or like an aardvark or like a sloth? I mean, what, how crazy would it be to have to name that? I mean, what would you name? I don't know what I would name it, but like Adam got to name all this stuff. And so God in Genesis 2 is like, bro, here's all this stuff. And look at that thing I made over there. Isn't that weird looking? That's so fun. God has a sense of humor. He really does. It's so like Adam's getting to enjoy all this stuff with Eve. And, and then God goes, hey, it's all good and stuff, but you know what? There's a tree right there. And I want you to be very careful. It's a tree of knowledge of good and evil. And you're not supposed to eat that tree because it's not good for you. And I've had people ask me, um, John Michael, why would God put a tree in the middle of the garden that he knew we were going to eat and damn all of, it, all of hum, hum, humankind, eternity apart from him, apart from Jesus? Why would he do that? If I gave you pizza to eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day of your life, what's your favorite food going to be? Pizza, that's right. Now, if tomorrow, though, for breakfast, I gave you some Mitchell's ice cream, what's going to happen? Your eyes are going to be opened. Okay, you're going to be enlightened, and you're going to go, ooh, minute, what just happened? And now when I ask you what's your favorite food, you're going to have to make a choice. You've always had pizza, but now, oh, my gosh, you got this thing over here called ice cream. If mankind only had good to choose from, would we actually be good? See, God didn't want robots. He wanted sons and daughters. And in order to have sons and daughters, you have to let them make choices. And God allowed us to make a choice. So he put that tree there. And in Genesis 3, unfortunately, we ate the fruit. And it damned all of humankind to eternity apart from God. But then in Genesis 3, God does something incredible. And he looks at Satan. He looks at the enemy of our souls. And he says, you know what? I know you want to battle this time, but there's coming a day when the seed of this woman that you deceived, he's going to, he's going to be born, and he's going to live a life of obscurity for 30 years, and then for three and a half years, he's going to have a public ministry, and then at the end of his ministry, he's going to be nailed to a cross, and you're going to crush his foot. You're going to strike his foot, but he's going to crush your head. And what God was prophesying in the Garden of Eden, where we lost it all, 
Thousands of years later, Jesus revealed the mystery of God's plan to save all of humanity for those who would believe at the cross that Paul said, I'm only gonna preach this because you see, Jesus died on a hill called Golgotha. You know what that means? The place of the skull. What did God say in Genesis 3? The seed of the woman, he's gonna come. You're gonna strike us hill, but he's going to crush your head. He's gonna crush your skull. And so with Christ, with his nailed feet at the cross, with his feet dripping with fresh blood, pouring out his blood for you and for me, he crushed the head of the enemy. He crushed the enemy's authority that we gave to him when we lost it at the garden. And at the cross, God revealed his mysterious plan through his power and Christ took back the kingdom that we lost. See, God's mystery is revealed through his power, church. And although it doesn't look like power to the rest of the world, we know the truth. And Paul said, I'm not gonna preach anything but the power of the cross. Now, how do we live this out on a regular basis? How do we live out God's mystery of Christ's salvation and through his power? What are you walking through right now? What dark season are you walking through? What difficult situation are you being faced with today? See, when Jesus was on the cross, that wasn't fun. That was the darkest day in the history of the world. And it looked like defeat. And in fact, in the world's eyes, it was defeat. But God knew on the other side, Sunday was coming. And so I'm asking you today, what is the thing you felt that, that, that's a cross for you in this moment? Is it, is it the threat of divorce hanging over your head? Is your marriage barely hanging on by a thread right now? Is, is it your estranged relationship with your child? And you're going, God, I, I don't know what to do. I've done everything. I've done counseling. I, I have, I, I've sat with him. I pulled a pastor in. We, we have done interventions. We've done this. We've done that. And I don't know what to do. I, I'm at a loss. Maybe you've been dealing with an addiction that just continues to beat you over and over and over again. And you're going, God, I don't know what to do. My friend, I'm here to tell you today that God revealed his mystery to save us 2,000 years ago at the cross. And the power that beat sin, death, hell, and the grave, if you're following Jesus, it's available to you right now. And God wants to reveal his mysterious plan for your life through his power. And that's available to you today. All you gotta do is say, God, would you make your power at work in my life. You see, God wants to reveal his mystery even through our, our most weakest, difficult moments with his power so that the world can't say that it's us. They have to say that it was him. So number one, God's mystery is revealed through his power. Number two, God's mystery is revealed through his wisdom, through his wisdom. And I want you to look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 10. He says, yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. He's talking about followers of Jesus there. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom. So there is combating Gnosticism that say, says they have a secret wisdom. Paul says, no, 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 no. God has the original hidden wisdom, which he predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, and he's gonna quote Isaiah chapter 64, verse four here. He says, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the human heart, all that God has prepared for those who love him. And in verse 10, he wraps it up by saying, for to us, God revealed them, what? The gifts he wants to give us. Through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. The mystery of salvation is revealed through God's wisdom. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is having a bunch of information and a bunch of facts. Wisdom is knowing how to use that knowledge. And the world's wisdom is different than God's wisdom. And Paul is saying that you and I have access to the wisdom of God. In fact, Proverbs chapter one, verse seven says, the fear of God, that means the uh, respectful, passionate pursuit of God is the beginning of wisdom. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are invited to participate and operate in God's wisdom. That means no matter what situation we step into, God says, hey, I wanna speak into that. And I'm actually, I put you in the middle of that so that I can reveal my mysterious plan of salvation by giving you wisdom that you don't have. 
that's a really good place for you to say amen. Because if it were left up to me, listen, I'm, there have been plenty of times in my life where I haven't felt very wise. I think that even this morning, I was like, I am not very wise. I felt pretty foolish multiple times in the last week, and I'm sure you have as well. And Paul says that we preach that we live from a place of true hidden wisdom, the wisdom that comes from God, the wisdom that existed before the foundations of the earth were laid, and it's greater than the wisdom of this world. And he wasn't knocking the fact that there are wise people who are outside of the cross, because there are, but they don't realize where their wisdom comes from. And so Paul says, ours is wrapped up in the cross of Jesus. God chose to reveal his mysterious plan to save us from our sins through what the rest of the world calls foolishness. And you know, Journey Church, when you live with the wisdom of God, when you allow him to reveal his mystery through you, it's not gonna make sense to the world. It's gonna butt up against conventional wisdom. Uh, last year, well, actually about a year and a half ago, hold on, let's see, how long has it been? I just turned 39, so you gotta give my, my, my brain a second to catch up. Let's see, about two years ago, we were looking at moving to Cleveland to join the Journey staff. And we were talking with Pastor Jim, Pastor Jen, Pastor Phil, and we were in Arkansas. And um, on our side of things, everything made sense to stay home, what we called home at the time. Um, I had a business that was starting to take off. Tiffany was doing really, really well at her job. Um, she was having fun, making a difference really just loving life. Our best friends lived seven minutes down the street. I could walk to our community pool. It was great. Uh, summer lasted for longer than like 30 days. It was wonderful. The sun existed for six months out of, the, actually longer than six months out of the year. I mean, it was amazing. And when we got the offer to come to Journey, in a lot of people's mind, it didn't make sense. It didn't seem like wisdom because we just bought a, year, a house, a brand new house a year before and everything else I just told you about, it didn't make sense. But we had to remember, it's not about what makes sense to us right now. It's what is God trying to reveal right now? What mystery is God revealing through this situation in our lives? Um, who could God be calling us to minister to in Cleveland if we said yes to this opportunity? How could God uh, bless our own family and reveal even more of his mystery? Is God inviting us right now to pursue him? Does he have a gift that we can't see right now that's on the other side of taking a big step of faith? When some of our friends, a lot of our friends and family are going, man, that just doesn't make sense. That doesn't make, you're gonna be moving the, the girls in the middle of the school year to not just across town, across the country. And listen, y'all, I'm from the South. So when, when, I, when I was presented at offering Cleveland, Ohio, I was like, that's Canada. Come on, that's the North to me, just to be honest. And I was like, there aren't gonna be biscuits and gravy. There's not gonna be sweet tea. Come on, I'm from Kentucky, okay? And so I'm thinking about the really important stuff here. And so you know what we had to do? We had to go, Holy Spirit, just like Paul said, the Spirit reveals these gifts, the Spirit reveals the mystery, he reveals the resurrection power of Christ and at his cross through every situation in our lives and that's what we're gonna preach, not only whenever I'm on a platform but with my life, I've gotta preach that message and so we just said, Holy Spirit, how do you wanna reveal the mystery of God in this season of our lives? And he spoke very clearly to us and said, go to Cleveland and we said, okay, yes sir. Was it easy? No. It wasn't easy. We had to sell a house. I had to pay mortgage and rent at the same time. That was real fun. Like, no thank you. That was expensive. We moved our girls in the middle of the school, the school year. That was hard. But you know what? God had, a, had multiple gifts hidden inside that. And in the mystery, he said, hey, come here. Pursue me. Yes, I got good things for you, but I want you to come find me. And Journey Church, listen, God had so many gifts, and a lot of those gifts, they're you. Friendships we didn't know we were gonna have. It's Pastor Jim and Pastor Jen. It's the whole staff here at Journey. We had no idea that God had those things waiting for us on the other side of mystery. And so I have to forsake sometimes conventional wisdom and go, God, I need your wisdom because my experience has stopped. The world's wisdom tells me this. It doesn't make sense. Don't do that. You're leaving your best friends. Don't do that. You've been more successful in that area of your life than you've ever been. Why would you leave right now? And Journey, you might be walking through something like that where you're 
you're feeling like God's speaking something to you and it goes against conventional wisdom. It goes against the, the wisdom of this age that we're having to butt up against. You are, are, maybe you're fighting with your spouse and you guys just can't seem to eye to eye and the world will tell you, hey, I know you've been married 23 years, but it's okay, just do what makes you feel happy. So if divorce is that, great, you can go find another spouse or if you don't want to get married again, that's okay, just do what you want. Love is love. And God says, you know what? I know it's hard right now, but if you'll trust me and lean into my wisdom, my spirit will reveal some things to you and I can restore your marriage. And it's gonna take some hard work and it's gonna take some effort. Would it be easier just to leave? Sure, for a moment. But you have to ask yourself, God, where are you in the mystery? How do you wanna reveal your crucified son and his resurrection power right now in this season of my life. And, and Paul was telling the Corinthian church, you have to remember what this is about. I didn't preach anything else to you except the power of God and the wisdom of God. You're gonna have to live upstream. You're gonna have to push against the culture and you're gonna have to say, Lord, I know what the world is saying, but I need you to speak and reveal your mystery to me. So God's power is, God's mystery, excuse me, is revealed through his power, and through his wisdom. And then lastly, God's power, or his mystery is revealed through his spirit. God's mystery is revealed through his spirit. I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 11 through 16. Paul says, for who among people knows the thoughts of a person except the spirit of the person that is in him? Aren't you glad that we can't read each other's thoughts all the time? Yeah, me too. That's scary. I don't want to know your thoughts about me all the time. You probably don't know what, you don't want to know all my thoughts about you all the time. And it's really frustrating when there's somebody who's really close to God and they'll tell you your thoughts. You never had somebody read your mail before, be like, hey, the Holy Spirit told me you were thinking this and you need to cut it out right now, buddy. I hate those people. I mean, I love them, but you know what I mean? Come on, it's a, it's a love-hate relationship. But Paul says, you can't really know the full thought unless you're the person. And he ties it to the Holy Spirit. And he says, so also the thoughts of God, no one knows really except the Spirit of God. And then in verse 12, he says, now we have, who's we? Followers of Jesus. What do we have? We have not received the lowercase s spirit of the world, but the uppercase, the spirit who is from God. Why? So that we may know the things freely given to us by God. God has gifts shrouded in mystery so that you pursue him and the Holy Spirit is the one who, who gives them to you and shows you what they are and how to use them. Verse 13, we also speak these things, what things? God's wisdom and the gifts he gives. Not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit. Are you seeing the theme here? The Holy Spirit's the one who's doing all the teaching, all the empowering. Combining spiritual thoughts and spiritual words. Paul's saying you can't speak what you don't know. I can't speak wisdom about an area that I haven't gotten God's thinking about. And the Holy Spirit has to show me. Verse 14, but a natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Verses 15 and 16, I love this. But the one who is spiritual, so the person who follows Jesus, discerns all things, yet he himself is discerned by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord, he's quoting Isaiah 40, verse 13 here, that he will instruct him, actually that should be a lowercase h, that anybody should, should instruct, the, instruct the Lord. But he wraps up with this, verse 16. We have the mind of of Christ. What's Paul saying here? Paul is saying that the Holy Spirit reveals God's mystery to you because you have the mind of Christ. How did you get the mind of Christ? Not because we're so smart, but when you receive Jesus' free gift of grace and mercy, when you receive God's mysterious plan of salvation for the entire world through his crucified son, one of the benefits is you get the mind of Christ. That means you get to think about what Jesus thinks about. And it also means you don't have to think about what Jesus doesn't think about. This is why I believe um, I'm a big fan of professional, uh, spiritual professional counseling. I've gone to professional counseling. I love it. We have the Joshua Tree here. It's incredible. Uh, I want you to have the letters after your name, and I also want you to know the Holy Spirit. I don't just trust my mind to anybody, okay? So if you need um, some mental health help, I encourage you to go to the Joshua Tree Center today. And with that... Um, you need the Holy Spirit because he can bring restoration to your mind in ways you can't even imagine. 
He's done it in my own life. And this is why when people say, well, my anxiety or my depression or my, and you fill in the blank, I don't like that. It's not yours because that means it owns you and it defines you. You can struggle with it, yes, but I just read that you have the mind of Christ. So that means that not only are you able to think the things he thinks about and not think the things he doesn't think about, you actually have your mind rewired. You can have it rewired, which is what Paul talks about in Romans 12 too. He says, do not be conformed to the world anymore, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. Renewing of your mind. Through who? The Holy Spirit. What does he do? Well, the Holy Spirit never says or does anything apart from what he hears the Father or Jesus saying or doing. He just reiterates it. In John 16, 3, Jesus said, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth will guide you into all truth. And in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then in John 16 or 7, I think it's 17, uh, Jesus prayed, Father, keep them in your word, uh, in your truth. Your word is truth. So how do you get the power of God and the wisdom of God revealed in your life so that God can reveal the power of the cross through you? By getting in his word and saying, Holy Spirit, guide me into all truth. Guide me to Jesus because I know he's the truth. And as you do, I'm gonna receive the power and the wisdom that only come from you. Would you give me that power? Would you give me that wisdom that I read in the word? When I read the gospels and I see Christ operating with the authority of the Father under the influence, under the power of the Holy Spirit, speaking with wisdom that nobody else had ever heard of before, doing miraculous, powerful things that were supernatural that no one had ever seen before to that level. I know that when I encounter Christ in the word Holy Spirit, you're gonna enlighten my eyes so that more of the mystery of God is revealed and so that more of the gifts that God wants to give to me and give through me are revealed so that his power and his wisdom are manifest in every area of my life. And in doing that, people are gonna see me and it's gonna be mysterious to them and they're gonna go, what makes you so different? Why have you remained faithful to your spouse for the last 43 years? Why are you still loving on your kids when they are acting crazy right now, when they treated you like this, when they stole from you, when they called the cops on you even when you didn't do anything? Why are you still loving on your kids? Why do you go to that church every Sunday morning and put a red Dream Team shirt on when I'm pretty sure they're robbing you? Why would you give up your sleepless, your, 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 your mornings and not sleep in and go play golf to, to go to that place and serve? Why would you do that? Because it doesn't make sense to them. And you're able to go, well, all I can tell you is that Jesus died for my sins. And he changed me. It wasn't because of my degrees. It wasn't because of my connections or my wealth or um, my power or any of that stuff. All that stuff filled. My marriage was on the verge of, of, of crumbling on the rocks. My, my relationship with my kids was going down the drain. I was in debt up to my eyeballs and I couldn't see a way out, but I gave my life to Jesus and he saved me. And now I'm not doing this life alone. I get to partner with my best friend. His name's the Holy Spirit. And whenever I need him, I call on him and he gives me God's power and God's wisdom. And God's going to reveal his mysterious plan to save that person through you. You see, there's the macro plan of God. He wants to save everybody in the world. He knows not everyone's going to choose him. That's the macro plan, but that's his heart is to save the whole world. And his micro plan is to do it one person at a time through you and through me. That's why I can't look at every situation based on just how it's going to affect me in the moment. I have to go, God, man, your wisdom doesn't make a lot of sense right now. I prayed for healing and it didn't happen. That breakthrough I've been believing for that we just sang about, I know it's coming, but it's not here yet. And it's really hard to trust you. But Holy Spirit, I thank you for the crucified Christ, my King, who embarrassed shame and defeated death, hell, and sin in the grave at the cross and won victory for me. And I know that you're in the mystery. I know you're there. And I know your power and your wisdom is available to, available to me. So Holy Spirit, would you show me what step to take? And when we, when we, when we do that, when we walk in unity with the Holy Spirit, Paul promises that the mystery of God is not only gonna be revealed to us, it's gonna be revealed through us through his power 
through his wisdom, and through his spirit. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm gonna invite your campus pastors to join me on um, their platform at their location. If you're watching online, uh, don't drop out just yet. I want you to hang on for just a moment. Our online hosts are gonna help you with your next steps in just a moment because we're gonna give you a, an opportunity to give your life to Jesus. Maybe you've never accepted the free gift of grace, the mysterious plan of salvation that God had since before the beginning of the world. And the day you realize, I want to do that. We're going to give you that opportunity in just a moment. But I want to pray for everybody at all of our campuses. Maybe you're watching online. I just want to pray that the power, the wisdom, and the spirit of God would fill you today fresh and anew. Father, I love you, and I thank you for your word. I thank you for the words that you had your, your servant, your son, Apostle Paul, write nearly 2,000 years ago to encourage us, to, to rebuke us even, to correct us, to challenge our thinking, to equip us for the work of the ministry you've called us to. And Lord, I pray for those who felt like their lives are void of the power of God. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would fall afresh and anew in their lives right now. In that place maybe uh, where they feel like um, their lives have been crucified and not in a good way because they know, uh, Lord, it feels like right now, it feels like that this is gonna be the death of whatever it is they're walking through. Would you remind them that Sunday is coming. Now, Lord, I don't know what that looks like for them, and I'm not gonna pretend to know, but Lord, that's where they can trust your wisdom and that they can find you in the mystery, that you're calling them to, per to pursue you, not just the gift but the of the power that you have for them, but your presence. And so, Lord, would you strengthen them and remind them that your resurrection power is alive in them today. God, those who need wisdom, who are facing, Lord, a... a a situation that seems like a giant mountain and they don't know how to go around it. They can't climb over top of it. And they, Lord, th their wisdom has run out. And the wisdom of the world isn't helping either. And they're realizing that they need a strategy from you, not just, not just facts, but they need to see things the way you see them. Holy Spirit, would you give them wisdom today, straight from heaven. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would fall afresh on us, your people today. Would you come alongside us? More importantly, Lord, you help us to come alongside you and invite you into the different areas of our lives where we need you to speak and reveal the mystery of God for our lives and then reveal it through us. We know we can't do it by ourselves. So Holy Spirit, would you fill us today? Would you give us God's power and his wisdom so that his mystery can be revealed?